Good uh, afternoon, I guess. Um, 15 minutes, this should be fun. Um, idea here is it's, it's not a Java talk, although my background is Java. Um, there's a little bit of mention of Java in there, but uh, I want to tell you how I've sort of uh, adapt to this. I want to go through some of the technology and um, how it's progressed and some of the things that I've learned over the, over the years. When I grew up, um, which wasn't quite as long ago as Morris here, <laughs> um, but when I grew up um, in the you know, 70s, I guess, when I was at school, the, the books we had, obviously there was no internet, the books we had had pictures like this in it, and I'd look through the astronomy books. This was the best picture in the world of uh, the Crab Nebula. And it is fairly spectacular. And in those days, it was spectacular. You'd open the pages, and you'd see this uh, picture of the um, Crab Nebula, taken in 1950. But they didn't do this every day, and we didn't improve over time. And there was no color. There was color film, but you didn't put color film into uh, these things. So for me, when I, again, even going to university in the early 80s, um, you either had to have a massive telescope in an observatory somewhere, or if you had a telescope in the back garden, this was about the best you'd see of Jupiter and Saturn. And even today, if I get a telescope out and you see these things, and they look roughly like that in a reasonably good telescope, it is fantastic. I mean, looking at the moon's one thing, looking at the moon in binoculars is impressive, very impressive. But when you see those celestial bodies floating there in the sky through a telescope, it is, even today, I still get the telescope out. I very rarely put a lens on it, but it is fantastic to see that, and it's what I get the neighbors over to see. But again, here we have, this is my sort of view of astronomy um, as I grew up and even at university. This today is what I took from my back garden. And not today, obviously. But um, this shows the sort of difference in technology that we can get out. And what I want to do is walk through some of the sort of steps um, and some of the changes in technology that we got there. This one was taken with a 200 inch in old money. Uh, so that's what, about five meters across. So a something about the size of the, these block of chairs here in, in, in size, and that's the size of the bottom of the telescope. Uh, mine is about that round and about that long, so it's, uh, it's, it's considerably smaller. Some of the challenges, certainly the big, biggest changes, are that we used to use film, and so we use film a lot, right the way up until the 70s uh, and 80s, and then, of course, along came CCDs, and I'm sure many of you remember or know of CCDs, uh, charge-coupled devices. The vastly more sensitive than photographic plates. Um, they're very precise in terms of the measurements, and we started to use CCDs to actually make measurements of, uh, in astronomy, and you can actually measure the number of electrons and therefore calculate the number of photons, and you can start to do some serious measurement that was not possible with uh, photographic plates. And then in the 90s, along came uh, CMOS um, sensors, and these things can have what's called a de Beyer filter on them, which is red, green, green, blue. We use two green because the eye is more sensitive to green, and you can't divide things into threes, so we use red, green, green, blue in, in the pixels. And in every camera, including your Androids, your iPhones, your DSLRs, etc., that's what you have. You have a um, RGGB or GGRB, uh, etc. They, they move them around depending on the maker, and these are the uh, sort of pictures we get. The disadvantage with the color is that for every four pixels, you're only getting red, green, or blue. And so you get bus roughly one third of the data out of it. So we tend to use uh, monochrome cameras, which means stripping off the, the filter. Um, and so monochrome cameras, despite the fact they have less technology in them, are actually more expensive because they're made for cameras. The biggest problem I have, and a lot of people have, is light pollution. This is taken out of my, um, uh, from my garden uh, with an iPhone. It's a sort of five-second exposure. You can't see it from here, but there's, I can just see the Orion's belt, Orion, and that's about it. That's pretty much all I can see if I go out. If I let my eyes adapt, I can see and recognize most of the stars. But that glow there is from the M4, which is about two miles or three or four kilometers south of me. And if it's cloudy, that literally glows yellow. Uh, this thing up here is the Pleiades, and that's basically what I can get out uh, with processing this. What we use, and the biggest change in technology, are filters. When we see uh, with our eyes, we have the visual wavelength from about 380 nanometers, which is sort of purple, purpley. Uh, you can see ultraviolet-ish um, across to red, infrared. And of course, down here, there's a massive uh, spectrum of infrared, which is where the James Webb Space Telescope goes. And of course, we get ultraviolet A, B, C, and then into X-rays, et cetera. But that's what we see. 
And basically, the camera sees from about here through to somewhere out here in the infrared. And so every photon that comes in is just turning one of those pixels whiter and whiter and whiter as it goes. And what happens is all the light pollution basically gives you that. That's a 10-second exposure without a filter, or in fact, just a, what's called a luminance filter, which just narrows it to here. This is the same scene, exactly the same scene, with a three nanometer filter. This is one of those filters. I won't get it out because I don't have time. Uh, sadly, these things cost about 500 pounds each. Uh, they're very precision made, um, down to three nanometers of bandwidth. And you have to buy different ones. This is the same filter, but it's slightly shifted by a few nanometers because of the different type of telescopes I use. I have to buy the filter twice. They are horribly expensive. But if you can see this, there is some um, glow coming out from the hydrogen alpha, which is the um, area that we're looking for on this. So this means we can basically start to see detail coming out. And that's one of the huge, huge changes in um, astronomy. And these things sort of existed, but not to the same scale that, that they exist today. Um, the use of AI has been massive in uh, astronomy, and this is literally just in the last... Some of this technology, which I'll show you here, has just come out in the last year, literally, just like everything else has just come out. And there's one guy who is, is making some incredible um, software, which is obviously making a fortune out of it, selling for about £60, uh, $60 or so, and every astronomer has got it because it's just so good. So what I want to walk you through here is just a few slides. This is the North American Nebula. Um, I didn't have time to rotate it round, you'll see it at the end. What I've done here is zoom on a small section. I use my laser. I love lasers. Um, this, zoom in on this small section here. The, this is basically supposed to be the, the Gulf of the US, the northeast coast, and the other coast is not actually North America, for those that didn't know. Um, uh, what I've done here is zoom. This, this is a stacked photo, so it's, it's about two hours or an hour and a half worth of photos. This is what we get. Using AI, we can do what's called uh, deconvolution. And what the AI does is it looks at the average size of these stars here, um, and it works out basically what the picture looks like if you were to do a line through the middle of them. And it's basically you've got the um, amplitude of the pixels here, and you've got the cross-section of the star, and it looks like this. It's called a point spread function, basically a Gaussian um, airy disk is, a, is another word for it. It works out what that is, and from that, it can actually work out the inverse of that, and then it applies the inverse, and we get much smaller stars here, but it also applies it to the entire image. So it basically means these features here that you see start to become clearer, and that's not the same as when you apply a sort of a sharpness filter. This is actually a real deconvolution that's done, and this is done through AI. So we get better sharpness, less bloaty stars out of it. So um, another thing we can do is we can run AI and we can eliminate the stars. The reason to eliminate the stars is because we want to process these separately. So here we've got um, the nebula with the stars in the background. We split them into two separate sheets. So we've got the stars and we've got the nebula. We can then process them differently. The stars, we want to get a little bit of color out of them. We want to de-bloat them. We want to take off some rings and sometimes some of the artifacts from diffraction. Uh, and the nebula, you want to bring the nebula out. And you want to apply different colors because we have different layers of oxygen and um, sulfur, et cetera, out of those. So this is what we do. Again, it's AI. This takes on a decent M2 laptop about a minute for one of the processes. But a lot of people complain it takes 10 minutes to go. But then they, they've got an old Intel box. Um, just zooming in on this little bit, again, on the top here, we again apply another AI, and this is denoising. Um, and because in this particular one, I've used a color filter, um, so it's got the RGB, the pixel noise is, um, it doesn't know whether it's red, green, or blue. And so the noise we get out here is a lot of chrominance noise. And what it can do is, basically, the AI looks at this and says this is probably this sort of color, and it basically applies a nice um, denoise on this. It's a little bit simpler, it's a little bit more complicated than simply just saying this is all this color. So the AI gives us a much, much better um, production from these. So again, these are the processes that we go through when processing it. And so this is what we get. I've 
shifted it around and rotated it. It's exactly the same image with a bit of processing. Uh, the section we were looking at is just down here, uh, on the bottom here. And the blue part here is emphasizing the oxygen uh, that's in the nebula. And so that's basically, we can go from this, I can bring that out in probably about five minutes or so, because I'm getting pretty good at the uh, software in this. Um, Java's role, I have to remember, I've only got 15 minutes here. Java's role in this is very limited. Um, my go-to programming language is, is, is Java, was Java. I think it still is Java. I mean, uh, pretty much take a problem, I can solve it with Java and do it pretty efficiently um, and pretty, pretty fast. But, um, and, and there are Java libraries out there, but honestly, most of the tooling we use, they create libraries in Python. Uh, most of the things I want to do are displaying graphics. And while I was absolute fan and loved JavaFX, it's a total pain in the ass to use or to get someone else to use it. Um, and I, there's no way I'm gonna touch JavaScript. So um, I've ended up um, learning Python, which I had to do for my uh, three uh, boys, all now at university. Uh, to help them with their uh, Python coding. And the, probably the biggest insight for me has been ChatGPT, because I, can t I know what I want to do, I know what I want to code, I know how I want to code it. I don't know the syntax of the language particularly well, so I just say, this is what I want to do, do it in Python. And ChatGPT prints it out, I cut and paste it, stick it into my PyCharm, uh, which is the IntelliJ one, and it is brilliant. It, it works 19 times out of 20. And if it doesn't, I just tell it what's wrong and it fixes it for me. So um, Python's really been the sort of uh, the, the change on here. And in ChatGPT, frankly, it, it, it's absolutely brilliant for this sort of stuff. There is a tool called PixInsight, which is, uh, it's incredible. It's written by uh, engineers and it does all, it's basically built just for astro astrophysics, um, et cetera. So the tools I do use, I use MATLAB a lot because there's a lot of calculus in astronomy. You've got, to, you've got these curves, you've got to work out how, how much of this pixel is getting the light. You've got to integrate, double integrate across um, a square area to work out the area under this three-dimensional curve. Um, I model this in Excel, um, so I've got big Excel spreadsheets here if anyone's interested, where I actually color code the things and, and do maps of stars. And then I actually do a lot of Swift UI. Again, it's another language. I, I know Swift reasonably well. Swift UI is new to me. Um, <laughs> and along comes ChatGPT. You basically say, OK, I'll model this in Python. I've got an Excel spreadsheet. You can paste the Excel spreadsheet in, and out it pops at the other end. And you've got your Swift UI. And I've now got little apps, which I've created, where I can get all of my data directly on. And, and that's basically how I work with these things. This has become. Uh, pretty much commoditized now. This is a new gadget which came out about a month ago. Um, it's, I haven't got one, it's about this size. It's basically everything. It's a telescope, does focus, does um, absolutely everything. You can sit it down somewhere um, and it'll, it'll basically get, give you some of the images that are out there. Um, this thing is amazing. This was uh, with my colleagues um, that I did astronomy with. This came out, this is a Raspberry Pi. Um, and in, it's got power down here, it's got USB down here. I plug it in, I plug my cameras into here. It does everything, and it's all controllable from my phone. And I can set the telescope up, it takes me 20 minutes for the smaller ones. Uh, these ones takes me about half an hour, 40 minutes for the larger ones. Um, I can set it up, I can get back into the house, pour a glass of wine, and I can do all of my astronomy for the whole evening with a few glasses of wine. Um, and I can watch Netflix. And then I get a huge pile of data, which is all on there on a little card. I can download it, and I spend the next three or four days processing it, uh, which does take a long time. Um, so if anyone's interested, this is a, an, an astronomy camera, which is a cooled camera, basically exactly the same as goes inside a Sony or a, or a Canon um, thing. These are the filters. You can look but not touch, because they're expensive. And this is a wonderful Raspberry Pi. So these are my telescopes, that's what I use. Um, this, in fact, is the same one. You put the camera on different ends to get different sort of features. And um, I think that's pretty much it. I've got a, a minute left. Basically, you don't need to go out and buy one of these massively expensive cameras or these stupidly expensive filters. On it. The, the filter array I've got actually costs more than my telescope, which is, which is ridiculous. This was taken with an ordinary camera, with an ordinary camera lens on an ordinary tripod with no tracking. That, that was 52 seconds, basically, so 51 second exposures, all stacked. That's the uh, Crab Nebula. 
no, the um, Orion Nebula, and this was basically using a, a tracker, a few hundred pound tracker, which basically tracks against the Earth. Um, and again, taken with an ordinary um, camera with an ordinary lens. So that's the sort of thing. That's what I started with, uh, not thinking I'd be able to do anything from London. And these inspired me to, to move on to the bigger ones. I think we've hit it on the nail. Thank you very much. <laughs>